Let's go to Psalms. This is my last study in this series, unless the Lord changes my mind. Yeah. I blame him, don't I? <laughs> Um, the interesting thing about Psalms 110, and notice how short it is, seven verses, and yet it is probably the most quoted Psalms in the New Testament of a ball. May not be the most famous, probably the most famous out of it is 23, Psalms 23, but... Um, you know, as the average person. But, and uh, the whole kit and caboodle is, is uh, messianic doctrine. And it's, uh, someday I'm going to come back with you and, uh, and I'm going to study Psalms 110 in the Hebrew with you because I think you'd really enjoy that. Uh, but it won't be tonight because I'm going to talk about Operation Footstool tonight because we've been in a series of lessons in fact, I counted them up, and since it was Halloween, this was my 13th lesson. <laughs> so, if I make through this, if I make it through this lesson, I'm not going to do any more. Uh, but anyhow, uh, it's just one verse that we're looking at tonight. <clears throat> but. I can show you right off the bat because you would think that the word Lord and Lord would be the same word, wouldn't you? It, it is, it, but, but it isn't. It is not the same word in the Hebrew. Uh, the Lord says, and, and that sounds like a verb, doesn't it? It's not. It's not a verb. Not a verb. <laughs> so this is kind of an interesting verse. It's not a. It's not a verb. Uh, set and make is, but uh, the Lord says to my Lord. Of course, it's the Psalm of David, isn't it? Sit, and that's a command in the Hebrew. Set at my right hand. That's a command. So the Lord is talking to the Lord, and he's not talking to himself. Do you understand that? Now, the first Lord is Yahweh. And the second Lord is Anonai, or Anane. You'll see it on your paper in a moment. So this is one member of the Godhead speaking to the second member. This is the first member of the Godhead speaking to the second member of the Godhead. And therefore, the command to set is very important to whom it is addressed. This was not addressed to David. It was prophesied by David. David took the role of a prophet in Psalms 110, 1 through 7. And when it says, the Lord says, and the word is not a verb, what he says to the Lord, to my Lord, when the Lord says to my Lord, sit, he puts it in a command, and how can deity speak to deity about setting? This is going to be very important for us in the New Testament. Because the only part of deity that can set is going to be the incarnation of the second member of the Godhead in a human body, right? And he's going to be a hypostatic person, undiminished deity and true humanity in one person forever. So we already start out with some pretty interesting stuff here in this little Psalms. Sit at my right hand. Who's, who's the my? Yahweh. And who is he speaking to? Adonai. He, the, the Father is speaking to the Son, as we know it. And then he has the word until. There is no idea for deity speaking to deity with a word like until. 
Do you understand that? Because if you look at the essence of God, like omniscience or omnipresent or any of these kind of things, and so this is a unique idea in the Old Testament. And how could you miss the incarnation? How could you miss it here? The virgin birth was prophetic, wasn't it? Even the city. All of that is prophetic. This is too. And it points to the incarnation. But it's not the only scripture points that, is it? I've just mentioned some. In fact, Actually, this goes all the way back to Genesis 3.15. <clears throat> Set up my right hand until I make thine enemy. Who, who's, who's the thine? Adonai. That's Adonai. And who is the I? The eyes always have it. The eyes always have it. Until I make thine enemies... A footstool for thy feet. That takes you all the way back, all the way back to Genesis 3.15. Right? Mm -hmm. You know the head and the heel business. Yes. Okay. See how smart you are. Isn't it good to know that stuff in your soul when you hear that? You go like, I know that. Isn't that good? Isn't that good? See, it's good for me because there was time when I heard that. I had no clue what they were talking about. So it's, it's wonderful to know that. The Lord says to my Lord, the word says, Nahum, N-E-U-M. It's on your paper. You'll see it in a moment. N-E-U-M. Notice that's a noun, masculine. That's an N-M. That's a noun, masculine. And it's used in the most unique way to give a prophetic utterance. And it holds what he's going to say because who is talking is more important. So you don't, you don't, you don't make it into a verb because they got one talking, one listening. This is something going on between the two that the conversation is now going to come out. This is the Lord, Yahweh, giving a prophetic utterance through David, David recording, but this in eternity to past is Yahweh, God the Father, speaking to God the Son in deity. See, omniscience can do that. I mean, who knows the thoughts of man, but God knows them, and God knows, you understand? Actually speaking at this point, they're in omniscience discussion. Isn't that interesting? And now it's recorded through David, the prophetic utterance that they're having without a discussion but omniscience talking to one another, I don't know. I'm just telling you why there's not a verb. And now we have the discussion, the, the part, listen to me now, the part of the discussion that can be revealed. You understand that? We've all had those conversations when we say, okay, you can let this bit of information out, but not the rest of it. You know, that's private, but you can talk about this, but don't talk about that. You ever had a talk with anybody like that? Hopefully your mate at some point or another, right? I don't know. We have it at my house a lot because I blab. So my whole family tells me, but they don't, because they know it's going to come out in the pulpit at some point before I can catch it. <laughs> out, and I go like, mm, I'm dead. So everybody, now with this telephone thing, I get it. I, I get a phone call, and then I get a text. 
then they tell me to put it somewhere inside my phone that I don't know what they're talking about in some kind of gallery or something. Then they say, well, if, it, if you don't, it'll be in the cloud someplace or something. <laughs> hey, who, are, who do you think you're talking to? I just gave up my flip-flop phone, you know, that flip-top, that, that flip whatever that was. And, and I, like, cried when I had to give it up. <laughs> but anyhow. And so here's, here's the part that's been revealed to us. In fact, seven verses. But the one part we're after, set up my right hand, that's a command, until... That's a, an important point in human history after the Messiah comes and has the capability of setting. Set up my right hand until I make thine enemies a footstool for thy feet. And this was prophetic to the first coming and second. One verse includes the first coming and second coming of Christ. Agreed? Because set up my right hand, second coming thine enemy business and, and, and all of that. All, so we've got, he's got to become, what a powerful idea. So I put this, I broke this, <laughs> I broke this one verse down into three parts. Um, sovereignty, I wanted three S words. So I, I've got sovereignty speaking omnisciently, uh, omniscience is speaking one to the other and then the prophetic utterance that was to be communicated to you and I, because the word says it's not a verb, right? Well, listen, you either have to trust me or come to Hebrew class. Now, if you come to Hebrew class, you don't have to trust me anymore. Okay. I'm just telling you. And so I put Yahweh and Adonai down there on your paper as it is in the scriptures. Then I saw, and so I saw sovereignty talking to sovereignty, but they weren't actually talking, were they? Because it's not, the word say is not verb. <laughs> but they were communicating deity to deity. <clears throat> and, <clears throat> and, then, and then what is revealed to David as a prophet is now given to us. The session set, now we know set up my right hand now in the real time, in real time. You know, people talk about real time. I'm talking to you in real time. Isn't that a funny expression? Real time like the rest of it isn't. I don't know what that, anyhow, but in real time. <laughs> Set. Notice that's a cal imperative. Cal imperative. Notice it's masculine singular. It's spoken to Adonai. The Lord says to Adonai, set at my right hand. <clears throat> okay, sit. Okay. Uh, then the second coming. Until I make, that's a cal imperfect, until I make, there's a, a going to be a point in history, even after the second coming. Say, I'm at the second coming now. Until I make your enemies, a cal participle, your enemies, a footstool for your feet. And uh, I wrote all that out for you that took Hebrew so you'd enjoy that. So let me have a word of prayer with you, and I'll talk about the example of footstool. A footstool for your feet. And, and he's talking about the enemy. Now, that's important because you can have a footstool, but this is a footstool that involves your enemy. See, this is not, I'm watching the ball game. Footstool. Where's that footstool I love? You know the one you sat on and rubbed my feet when I watched the ball game. I know that was a, that was a, a that was an amazing dream I just had, wasn't it? Uh, gentlemen, you get that before you get married, right? I don't you don't get it afterwards. Well, I know he taught every one of his grandkids to do it. I wish I'd known him earlier. I got Evelyn. I'm working on Evelyn. I'm working on Evelyn. She's my last hope. 
to be able to have what Coach had. Those kids would come in. I tell you, they knew exactly what to do as soon as they walked through the door. The quarter. Jesus, they don't want a quarter. They haven't stopped by my house for a quarter. Well, let's have a word of prayer. There's a moment to check your spiritual position in Christ and in this Bible study. They ought to be on the same page. You're, you were saved to be a spiritual person. You are one. This is a great opportunity. The Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living, and this is what we're talking about in the process of learning what the Bible says for us how to live. You can't learn it in carnality. An example of carnality, identity of carnality in your life is personal sin. It could be mental attitude, sin, sins of the tongue, or overt sins. And what do I do and why? Well, what you do is you confess your sins. Homologeo, 1 John 1, 9. He's faithful and just. That is, on the Lord's part, he's faithful and just to forgive you and to cleanse you. That's a, a thank you for the grace of God that it, is extended from the cross into your life, the propitious work of Christ for sin and for the punishment has been brought to your life never to have that experience again. I'm not talking about discipline. I'm talking about punishment. <clears throat> and uh, that's not for salvation. That passage is not for salvation. It's for sanctification because the Holy Spirit when you confess your sin, it brings you back into fellowship of 1 John 1, 5. Brings you back into fellowship through the, through the idea of sanctification. You're set apart unto holiness for the Bible study. So, Father, we're thankful tonight. We, we pray this exercise not only for these who are in our study by automobile, but those who are with us by Internet, the same Etiquette, classroom etiquette is required of all who study with us because we want them to get the maximum out of this hour of study on this enormous study called Operation Footstool, which we looked at in Psalms 110.1. So teach us tonight, Father. Let us see the dynamics of it as it plays out in biblical history and how we might understand it as church-age believers in Jesus' name. Amen. An example of footstool, the enemy, the footstool, enemy footstool, is uh, there are a lot of, there's a lot of examples of this. Um, David and Goliath, he did it with Goliath. He put his, he put his foot on his neck when he, when he, when he fell to the ground, he put his foot on his neck and then did other things. In Joshua, one of the one that I really like is Joshua 10, 23 through 25, what you can read later, but Israel was at war with the coalition army of the Amorites. There were five kings that had joined their forces together at Israel to wipe them out. And, you know, listen, when, when the forces, when that many, that was like four more than they needed. And there were still 100 short because God fights for Israel. You understand? But he will for you too because of your relationship with Christ. No matter how, no matter how big the, the warfare wages against your life, know that it's a good thing, not a bad thing. Realize it's not a personal thing either. It's a God thing. And you'll do better off in it. Because God will fight your war. He, he will, he will, listen, you, you've got to fight the, fight the good fight of faith. But he takes care of everything else when you do. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> everything else. In warfare, he takes care of. Well, in the Amorite, the, the Amorite coalition of five kings, um, they come out to wipe their attitude was, I'm going to wipe you off the face of the earth. Well, that was a good strategy, except they didn't consider the God of Israel. 
And so that fight didn't go very well for them. They got defeated terribly. And the five kings were captured and they were brought before Joshua. And it's well worth your read later, not now. And he had them bow down and had each of the commanders of the forces that fought them on, on what? Five fronts, you know. He had his commanders that fought him on the five fronts come and put their head up on their necks. And when he did, when they did, here's what Joshua said to the rest of the troops. Here's was his speech. I love these kind of speeches, short and sweet. Do not fear or be dismayed. Be strong and be courageous. For thus the Lord will do to all of your enemies whom you fight. How do you like that? And then they executed him. But they put their, their combat boots upon their necks. That's Operation Footstool in Joshua 10. <clears throat> That's victory over your enemy and is to honor God. So I'm going to talk about Operation Footstools. I'm going to give you four points for you to understand how this fits into biblical history and, and into the plan of God. The first point, when I did it, I went, this is crazy, but I have to do it anyhow for you. Conquering the enemy of the angelic conflict is what this is about in regard to Christ. Require, listen, is going to require, this is enormous. This is how big this war is. It's going to require both the first and second coming of Christ to get him. Now think about that. That's how big this war is. I mean, we don't even know how many, a third of the angels that are part of that army, how many that is. But it's a, a whole lot. Operation Footstool, it will take the first coming and the second coming to do it. This is a pretty powerful idea. I want you to go to 1 Corinthians with me. I want you to go to 1 Corinthians in the 15th chapter. I want you to look at verse 27 and 28 for a moment with me. I don't think this is on your paper. Is it? Okay. Oh, it's the third scripture down. Well, just hold your place. <laughs> no, let's just go there. I'll do the third one. It don't matter what order. Let me do this one. Uh, First Corinthians, because it's, it's hot on that. He, here's what he says. Look at verse 26. He says, the last enemy that will be abolished is death. Then he says in verse 47, for he has put all things in subjection under his feet. If you have a reference Bible, you're going to see that that's probably a reference in there. There's probably a reference in there uh, to that. It could be a, to a Psalms 8 or a 110. But when he says all things are put in subjection, it is evident that he's, he is expected who put all things he is accepted who put all things in subjection to him. And when all things are subjected to him, then I want you to look at when and then. Now watch, pay attention to when and then because you miss these things. And when all things are subjected to him, then the son himself will also, all will also, will, then, then the Son himself also will be subjected to the one who subjected all things to him, that God may be all in all. That is at the absolute end of human history when he does that. In the meantime, he sits on the throne. <clears throat> or, or comes back for warfare. When and then, when all things are subjected to him, that's the end of you, that's... You know, we're at the end of the great white throne judgment, all that business. Then he will put it back under the Father. 
that's an enormous thing. And when, did, when did the Father put it back under him? You know what it was? When he sat down at the right hand of God the Father, that, that we're talking as, as ascension session in the reality of human history. Wow, I mean, that's, I'm telling you people, that's lights out stuff. Uh, that's lights out. Uh, uh, this thing goes all the way back up. I put on your papers, this thing goes all the way back up to verse 23. Verses 23, 24, and 25. He talks about the order of the resurrection. Then he talks about, then comes the end when he delivers up the kingdom. For he must reign until he has put all of his enemies under his feet in 25. I mean, it's a powerful passage. It goes all the way down to 28. I mean, it's a powerful passage. Uh, let, let's go to another one. Let's go to Matthew a moment. I, I just, I'm, I'm showing you how he's using Psalms 110 uh, in the first coming, second coming. Matthew 22. Uh, I picked Matthew's. Um, it's in the synoptics. See that word synoptics? That means it's Matthew, Mark, and Jude. Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It's called the, they're called the synoptic gospels. Uh, and uh, I took Matthew, not Mark and Luke. I just took Matthew. I, I just liked it. Uh, so here I am in Matthew 22, 41. 22, 41, uh, which starts a new section, right? If you have a study Bible, you will see that we're in a new section. Uh, verse 41 should be in bold print, is it? Is your Bible study got it? Or, or a heading. You could have a heading. Now, when the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them a question. That was unusual. Do you know how? That's very unusual. Usually everybody was asking him questions. So it was unusual for him to instigate. That, that's kind of interesting. So while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them a, a question. He said, what do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? Oh, they said he's the son of David. He said, well, I've got another one. Then how does David in the spirit call him Lord? In other words, they know what he's talking about. Well, then why did Yahweh call him Adonai? Then he, then he quotes. He says, the Lord said to my Lord. I mean, they, they know the Hebrew. Set up my right hand until I put. See, and, and if David then called him Lord, how was he his son? In other words, we got the Lord talking to the Lord. But how is David? And, and we, know this is, we know this is the prophetic word of David. If David then calls him Lord, how is, how is he his son? And in that text. Now we know that Jesus is supposed to be the son of David in Luke 1, 31 through 34. But that's not the text he gave him. And this is the text he gave him. Well then how about how about Psalms 110 1, right? And you know what he did this time? He shut down whatever argument. They always came to argue, right? They always came to argue. He shut it down. Look at, look, at, look at verse 46. And no one was able to answer him a word, nor did anyone dare from that day on to ask him another question. <laughs> but, but we're in Matthew 22 now, aren't we? So just remember where you are. You're not at Matthew 2. <laughs> oh, my goodness. That says, uh, so the question that he's at, what the question he's really asking them is, who was Christ before he was glorified and 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 ascended? I mean, who is this? Who is he that's going to come to earth and is going to one day sit at the right hand of God the Father in heaven? And they got to, uh, it's good when you can shut down a conversation that quick in it and go to bed. Here is Acts 2. Let's go to Acts. Let's go to Acts. Acts, the second chapter. We're with Peter at Pentecost. 
in Acts 2. I mean, all of these are studies in themselves. You know that, don't you? And I'm just hitting the highlights, and I, I really hate hitting the highlights on. But maybe, maybe one day I'll come back and take each of them. The, each of them is just a wonderful story in itself. But here we are, brethren. I'm in verse 29. And he's at Pentecost. And brethren, I may, confidently, I, I may confidently say to you regarding the patriarch David that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. And so because he was a prophet, he knew that God had sworn to him with an oath to seat one of his descendants upon his throne. So he looked ahead. This is kind of interesting on his part. So he looked ahead and he spoke of the resurrection of Christ. Look how he's put all that stuff together. He looked ahead. He looked ahead. David is one thousand BC. That's a good look ahead, eh? Thousand years. Something like that. He looked ahead and he spoke of the resurrection of Christ. That he would neither be abandoned to Hades nor would his flesh suffer decay. So that's a three day business. This Jesus God raised up again to which we are all witnesses. Therefore, having been exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured forth this which you both see and hear. For it was not David who ascended into heaven, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make thine enemies a footstool for thy feet. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and and Anai, and Christ, the Messiah, this Jesus whom you crucified. That's pretty powerful. That's pretty powerful. Like that, don't you like that? Whew. See, I like that word, therefore, because therefore means why for, and he just really nailed it. <laughs> he did such a good... Then, then, we, then we'll go to Hebrews, because I did... The other one early. We go to Hebrews. Well, let's see, James, back up. Went to Hebrews. I'm going to Hebrews, first chapter. Hebrews 1. And we'll do the first chapter verses. We'll, we'll, we'll jump in the middle of one here. I don't like to do it, but we'll do it. He's all over the Psalms. <laughs> he's all over the Psalms. Because he's talking about Listen, in chapter 1 of Hebrews, he's talking about the superiority of Jesus Christ to angels. And you know what the enemy of Christ is going to be? Huh? In the angelic, angelic conflict? <laughs> well, there's... A, get that one right on the test, couldn't we? So, here we go. Here we go, 10. Thou, Lord, in the beginning did lay the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thy hands. They will perish, but thou remainest, and they will all become old as garments. See, we're at the end of the whole shoot match, aren't we? And as a mantle, thou will roll them up, in a, and as a garment, they will also be changed. But thou art the same, and thy years will not come to an end. But to which of the angels has he ever said, Set up my right hand until I make thine enemies a footstool for thy feet. So he made a question out of it, didn't he? He made a question out of it. Are they not all ministering spirits sent out to, to render service for the sake of those who inherit salvation? He used that in that passage. Jesus, superior to angels, both elect, I mean all angels. You know why? Because, because he's the son of the almighty God. He is 100% deity. When he came to earth, he was 100% humanity as well. Pretty powerful idea. Then we go to the 10th chapter. I want you, oh, I want to show you something interesting. I, 
you always look for, I, I want you to always, when you read a passage like this, always look for key ideas. For example, this thing starts in verse 5. And I'm in Hebrews 1, and it starts in verse 5 when he gets into this discussion about the superiority of Jesus Christ angels. And, and watch, watch, it, watch a little phrase, and you look for these because these are markers. Look at verse 5. He ever says, do you see that? Or, or maybe your Bible says, he says. You see that in verse 5? Okay. Look at verse 6. I put this on your paper. Look at verse says. Look, look at verse says. 6. See where it says, he says? He says. Mine says, says he. Sorry. Look at verse 13. He ever says. You know what that is? Those markers, you know what those are for? You divide that whole passage into those sections. That's where they are. They're their markers. He says this, then he says this, then he says this. And, and then when you put them together, da 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 That's what you have. I just think that's fun. Isn't that not fun? Then it makes Bible study for me exciting. The first thing I do, I look in the English, see if I got anything. Then I look in the, the Greek or the Hebrew to see if it's actually what that means. <laughs> and if it does, I go like, cha-ching. I know how to break this thing down now. I know exactly how to break that down. And, and he's got three different ideas going on here. It just makes, so I just tell you what, you can have fun in Bible study. I'll write a little book one day. So here's how to have fun in your Bible studies. Look for markers. Well, the last thing you want to do is Evelyn find markers. We got her, she She's learned to work, work markers, and we now got them everywhere over the house. You can't hide them. You know, once they find them, you can't, you can't hide them. You can't. How do little kids, they can find anything you hide. You could take it out to the garage and put it into something that they know nothing about. And somehow they watch you. There's eyes on you. That's the darndest thing I ever seen. I suppose my kids did it too, but I didn't see it because I was usually gone. Jane had to deal with it. Now I've got grandkids. Here's Hebrews, the 10th chapter. Let's take a look at chapter 10. And what am I doing? I, well, I'm running down Psalms 110.1, right? We've been in, he's been in all of these. Well, I'm back to James. My goodness. What does James want? Well, James wants to talk to me, I guess, but not now, James. Uh, ninth verse. Then he said, Behold, I have come to do thy will. I love that. Oh, my goodness. If we could just, if we could just get that in our soul. Behold, I've come to do. He lived by that motto, didn't he? He takes away the first in order to establish the second. He's talking about the first covenant to, in order to establish the second covenant. What one do you live under? God bless you if you do, because half the church, I'm not necessarily mine, but half the church lives under the old one and call it the new one. I don't know how you can do that. that would, they wouldn't do good in the clothing business, would they? Uh, let's see. And by this will, we have been sanctified. What will? Wait, what will? We don't have to guess now. Come on now. We don't have to guess. It's in verse 9. Right? And what was the will of God? What, yeah, what was it? It tells you what it was that he's talking about. What was he, what's he talking about? Do away with the first covenant to establish the second one. You know what the old covenant? That's half your Bible. What you, what's half your Bible called? What's the first half your Bible called? Old Testament. Old, Old Testament. Or the old covenant. Yeah, well, it's just, he says, I come to do away with the old covenant to establish a new covenant. All right. By this will, which he just described, we have been sanctified. What did he do? You know, you know why he did away with the old one? Is because he fulfilled it. Everything necessary 
he fulfilled in the first coming, and then everything will be attached to that will be in the second coming. Right? Yep. Only to when he fulfilled it. Yep. By this will, we know what that is, agreed? It's in verse 9. For by this will, we, we, because he completed the first one, fulfilled it, right, in the first advent, therefore, as new covenant people, as new covenant, right? We're new covenant people. My goodness, you know, we're going to do it Sunday. What are we going to do Sunday? First Sunday of every month. We're going to do the Eucharist. And it's called the blood of the... Hello, Jesus. By this will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. What, what, what's he talking about? He's talking about the crucifixion. And every priest stands daily ministering and offering time after, after time, same sacrifices, that's a key word in this, sacrifices, which can never take away sins. They were never intended. They were to point you to Christ who can take away your sins. What will wash away my sins, right? <laughs> that old song? Right, all right. But he, having offered how many sacrifices for sin? One. Listen, when you accept that, that's all you got. It's sufficient. It's been finished. Therefore, you're not going to lose that salvation because of some gobbledygook thing you've done. You understand that? But think of the worst thing you could do, like eating two pieces of pie. <laughs> but he had been offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, Sat down for all times. How do we listen? And what did he do? He sat down at the right hand of God. Where's that? Third, Third heaven, right? Waiting. Why is he? He's setting what? Doing what? Waiting. Waiting from that time onward until his enemies be made a footstool for his feet. Look how he broke that. Look how the Psalms 110 1 were bro was broke down. Isn't that neat? He's preaching, man. He's preaching. And he, he looked for markers and went, Tee, I got one. And he broke it down into two points. And, and listen, what's his theme? One offering for sin. For by one offering he has perfected for all times those who are sanctified and the Holy Spirit also bearing witness to us for after saying, and then he goes on to more discussion on it. All right? It's powerful. He, he took that thing into the first coming of Christ and split it down. First coming, second coming. That's so good. <laughs> that is so good. I just gave you... I just gave you five of the most gigantic passages that explain Psalms 110.1 you could ever hope to get in a million years. Well, they all are, honey. All of them in there showing he's fulfilling them. Yeah. He's fulfilling them. In the 10th chapter, verse 1, 3, 5, 8, it's mentioned two times, 11 and 12. Christ has one sacrifice for all sin, and it's sufficient. It's in verse 1, 3, 5. It's mentioned two times in verse 8 in the 11th chapter. I mean, the 11th verse and the 12th verse. In other words, the first 18 verses, that's the, the marker is the word. One sacrifice for sin for all time. I mean, it just the whole first 18 verses, chapter 10, that's all he talks about. And, he, and he's all over the Old Testament showing how it, was, how it was fulfilled as part of the will of God being done, wasn't it? And why we're under a new covenant. It's just... And look at verse 18. I never did get to verse 18, but look how he closes this down. Chapter 10, look how he closes it down, the first half of it. He says, now, now where there is forgiveness of these things, there is no longer any offering for sin. There's none. 
Isn't that wonderful? Okay. He brought you the offering by grace. Now, here's the second point. <laughs> second point. It's funny, isn't it? Second point. And I just gave you five points out of point one, didn't I? And, and let me tell you, that was, that's sufficient. That, that's a lot of stuff there. <laughs> While Jesus Christ sits at the right hand of God the Father in heaven, Operation Footstool is a doctrinal principle of prophecy for the church. Agreed? I mean, we saw how the writer of Hebrews broke the first half down into the first coming and the second, and the other half into the second coming in the 10th chapter. Here it is again. Behold, I've come to do your will. We know what that was, right? To separate the covenants, right? Uh, to fulfill the old in the first coming. But he has offered one sacrifice for sin for all time, sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time onward until, waiting until his enemies he made a footstool for his feet. See, now, see, we live in that period, right? This is the period. Listen, and I, I say this often, and maybe one day it'll click. You couldn't have been born <laughs> at a better time in biblical history, in a better nation, at a better time, Ever. Now, I know whatever time you're born is a pretty good time. It's just kind of good to be here, I guess. But when you look at the big scheme of things, and let me tell you, America is worth fighting for. And it's worth dying for. Let me tell you, I've said this to all my family members. I'll throw my football away, but I'll not throw my flag. My father didn't die for football, but he did die for an American flag. This just upsets me so bad today, I can, I can hardly spit. I've become Southern, haven't I? <laughs> I haven't been able to hit a chicken yet, but <laughs> I've got by the idea that I could actually spit if nobody's looking or the, or the wind. It's got to be a certain way. The wind has to be a certain way. I've discovered that. Yes. Right. The service. Mm -hmm. Because they're Never done. Right. Because Christ has not fulfilled it. Right. Shattered yeah. Christ. They forgot that in the first coming, didn't they? That's where I stand. Why don't we stand? Yes. Well, then that we just have an interesting time here, aren't we? <laughs> but when Jesus Christ, listen, sets. Look at the difference between sets and leaves. When Jesus Christ leaves the right hand of God, the prophecy of Operation Foot, Foot, Footstool will be fulfilled. The Lord said to my Lord, set up my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made them Lord. Listen, it's when he leaves that right hand. And that's what our studies have all, all been about in eschatology, hasn't it been? And he leaves that and comes back in the tribulation. He does great war and all that. The, I just quoted out of Acts 2 on your paper. The third thing is that the scriptural background to Operation Footstool was first given in Genesis 3.15. That's the foundational text. This angelic feud began in eternity past with the fall of Satan and a third of the angels, Isaiah 14, 12 through 15. Ezekiel 28, 11 through 19 as far as reference points, and Revelation, the 12th chapter, the entire chapter. It is during that period of time when Satan has fallen and the, the, and the, and, and the curse, what is called curses are being measured out to them. And it is the Lord exercising a curse upon the serpent. 
And he says, I will put enmity, enmity. Enmity is the manifestation of an enemy. Enmity. That, that's the, the word enmity and enemy in the Hebrew are, are synonymous ideas. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel. The word bruise, I put, said, is the same word used in the same way, so I said it's the same. Right? It's a cal and perfect. This indicates, the way this is stated indicates two feuds, two conflicts. There's a personal conflict between Satan and the woman until the birth of Christ comes. Right? And even connected with the woman, he tries to kill the baby, right? In the attack upon the, on the babies born in Bethlehem. Then the feud goes with the, the coming of the child, then the heir to this, then the feud becomes hereditary, heretical. It, it, it is the seed of the one against the seed of the other. And that's where we are today, right? I mean, we're, t we're the children of God in Christ. We're sons of God in Christ, right? Right. So there's two feuds here. There's one that deals with Satan and the woman till we get to Christ. And then when Christ comes, dies on the cross, the day, uh, all the things, you know, burial, resurrection, ascension, ascension, then it, it becomes the warfare is against the children, the heirs. The, the heirs, the, the inheritors, and that's who we are. And so the angelic conflict, we're, we're in the middle of this whole business. Whether you like it or not, the angelic con conflict wages against the seed of Christ. The church. The church. Theologians refer to Genesis 3.15 as proto-evangelism or the first gospel. Paul saw the fulfillment in the eschatology of Jesus Christ in Romans 16.20 when he said, the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. From start to finish, in Genesis 3.15 we have the start. In Revelation 20.10, we have the finish. Start to finish. The finish is this. The devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are also, and they will be tormented forever and ever. Remember that? We dealt with that with the beast and the false prophet. So, see, now you see. Uh, look, how, how wonderful it is to be able to sit and see the whole pan panoramic thing, isn't it? We said under the new covenant, we're able to see the whole thing. We're able to see the whole thing from one end to the other, from the start to the finish. I mean, we're such privileged people in the word of God. We have the Holy Spirit to teach us every bit of it. And, and, and when you're interested and you get into the word of God and you begin to study it, then you have the same experience. He just puts fire in your bones, doesn't he? I mean, there's just an excitement when the Holy Spirit begins to teach you and reveal to you things from the Word of God. It just, there's, I mean, it's just a burning. I mean, I don't know how to explain it. It's not like indigestion or anything. It's just, it's a, it's a warm glow or something. I, I don't really know. But when you got it, you got it. You know what I'm saying? When it, when it comes to you, it's just a phenomenal thing. Um, like the two guys on the road to Emmaus when he opens the scripture and explained to him and they went like, <laughs> oh, oh. I love that. I, I love teaching you because you have that same interest. Now, you don't pay any attention. I, I, nobody, I, I haven't seen anybody in so long to look at their watch. Not that you even have one anymore, but. Is, it's such a privilege to teach you. There are three phases of the operation, uh, operation uh, footstool. 
I want to mention. Um, and and listen, when you l listen, when you get time, I want you to write this scripture down. I want you to read this. This is so, this is so much fun. I want you to write this scripture down, Romans 8, 31 through 39. And, and listen, here's how I want you to study it. There, there, there's going to be a series of seven questions asked and answered. <laughs> you're going to love this. I tell you, you're going to love that study. Seven? Oh, that could be a gate question. I don't know. Could be. It could be. I know there's seven. I do know that. Of course, one of you will count eight, but you always do. Somehow or another, I just missed one. But I went back and checked them a double time, but that don't mean nothing, except that I counted them. But there, there, there are at least seven questions in there and answered, and these are phenomenal. I mean, you want to talk about a Bible study, there's one for you. Uh, phase one, two, and three. Phase one involves the death, burial, resurrection, ascension, session of Jesus Christ. It involves, listen, his first coming involved disarming. I love this. Look at Disarmed him. Jesus Christ, when he died on the cross, was buried and raised from the dead, ascended back to the Father, seated at the right hand of God, disarmed the evil forces. Disarmed him. They don't have power over the church at all. In fact, greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. Oh, they would if they read, wouldn't they? They would if they read. But isn't that a phenomenal idea? He disarmed them. I mean, you know, they have to borrow your truck to kill you. Right? They got no arms. Now, they'll still try to borrow your truck to kill you, right? But listen, they ain't got one of their own. They ain't got one of their own. They ain't got no arms. There is no force that can be used against you. No power. None. And so what he tries to do is try to intimidate you with fear and doubt and distrust and all that stuff. He's a lion without any teeth. He's just got a big roar, and half the time he moans. He goes, ooh, about the best he gets. It amazes me how many Christians fear this guy. Got no weapon. He has to borrow yours to fight with. Can I borrow your sword for a minute? <laughs> got none. He was disarmed. Colossians, the second chapter, 14 and 15, tell you that. Third chapter, verse 1, says it's still in force. Ephesians 1, 20 through 23, and 1 John 4, 4, that I quoted, greater is he who is in you than he is in the world. He'll tell you, well, you know, I'll take that from you. You can't. I already gave it to God. Da -na 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 -na. <laughs> See? Don't let him try to get something. Don't hold on to something. Give it to God all right. Give it to him right away. Well, I'll take that from you. Uh-uh. What do you mean, uh-uh? <laughs> See, he hates that song. That's a song he hates. Here's phase two. Involves the battle of Armageddon and the baptism of fire. Now, I was going to do the baptism of fire, but I'm not because I'm going to do the four baptisms associated with Christ on Wednesday night. I'm going to start a new series on Wednesday night. One of those is called the Baptism of Fire. Uh, it's actually eschatology, but I'm going to put it, I'm not going to do it on Tuesday. I'm going to do it on Wednesday, uh, and I'm going to run this series during the month of November. Try to have a happy, happy Thanksgiving. Yeah. Because what Christ did for us. Uh, so we have Armageddon and Baptism of Fire. It, it involves Satan and all the fallen angels being removed from the earth for a thousand years of millennium. And I gave you Revelation 9, Revelation 20, Revelation 118, 2 Peter 2, 4, 
Zechariah 13, 2, and then phase three. Involves Satan and the fallen angels being thrown in the lake of fire. Hoo -ah! <laughs> yeah. Devil don't like that one either, I guess. Involves Satan and the fallen angels being thrown into the lake of fire forever and ever. Matthew 24, 41, Revelation 1, 18, 27 through 10, and verses 14 and 15. I want to close with Hebrews 12, 2. Is it on your paper? Okay. It is now, though, isn't it? All right, write that on there. Yeah, Hebrews 12. I love this verse. This is one of my. I love it because it starts with a good old southern word. No. <laughs> no, but it does start with a good old southern word that I never did understand when I first came to the south. Fixing. 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 <laughs> Fixing our eyes. Fix Hebrews 12, 2. Are you, is that say fixing? It actually says fixing. Look at, well, that's a Yankee Bible. <laughs> Fixing. That's a, Fixing. I know. It is, it, it, it means to, it, it's okay, Tony, to have a look. It means to stare, to, gl to um, it means to stare, to, what else do you do? Steadily. Do what? Stare steadily. Stare steadily? <laughs> okay. Stare steadily. That's kind of hard when you get <laughs> our age in it. Yep. <laughs> stare. Fix, fixing, fixing our eyes. Did, you, did some guy sitting in Taiwan or someplace like that <laughs> just thought, having a beer, thought he'd, turn that, let me see this guy. I've been entertaining, I can tell you that tonight. Fixing. That's how we talk in the South. Fixing. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy, listen to me, who for the joy set before him endured the cross despising the shame and is set down at the right hand of the God, the father of the throne, the right hand of the throne of God. And that what a powerful idea, huh? So why do you think he said fixing your eyes on him? Hmm? So your mind could be blank. You know, deers in the headlight. What 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 what's he want you to think about? He wants you to stay focused. Well, listen what he says. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfect of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despised the shame, and sat down. Why do you think you're being persecuted in this life? Why do you think you're getting under attack all the time? Why do you think? Uh, why do you? What? Why? What? The angelic conflict. You're identified with this man, and he wants you to have the same attitude because, listen, the victory's been won. All you got to do is fight the fight. The victory, listen, the victory's, the victory's there. The victory's there. Be sure that when you're fought, you can put your foot on the, on the neck of the enemy because it's been won. I don't care what, what I don't care what, I don't care what your life faces. I don't care what it, listen. Fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of your faith, who for the joy set before him wants that joy. Listen, consider it all, well, wait a minute, wait a minute now. James 1, one 2, consider it what? When you what? When you what? So you can't sit around and just consider it all joy. What you considering? Right? When you fall into diverse or various trials and temptations, etc. Right? Say joy. Say he says, listen, fix your fix your fix your attention on me. I'm the author and perfecter of your faith, and you can have that joy. I want it for you. I want it. Not want it. I want it. Right? Did you hear the difference? Yeah. 
Okay, sometimes I can't. Oh, what a, what a great night to be with you people. Come on back tomorrow night. We start a new study. You people on the internet, come on back tomorrow night. Jesus Christ is associated with four important baptisms in the Bible. We're going to talk about them this month of November. Tomorrow is the first, ain't it? Well, that's why I said month of November. I guess. Well, let's have prayer, and then we'll do our. Does it seem? Does this seem later than Tuesday? Is it just me? For some reason, I think it's. I, me too. I'm all day long. I kept thinking it's Thursday, and Jane said, "Are you going to church tonight?" And I went, "Uh." Good thing I have one in the hip pocket. No, it's not yours. <laughs> Willie, Willie Semrose, Willie Semrose, the good thing about age is you forget it. <laughs> you forget your age, your date, the time, what day it is. I went, that was, I believe I'm there. I think I qualify. Father, we're so thankful for this group of people and for our study tonight on Operation Footstool. What, what have we learned tonight, Father? Oh, so many principles. So many principles. But I'll tell you, the victory is ours. Jesus won it. He disarmed him. When he comes back the second time, he's going to just, oh, wow. <laughs> Jeez. It ain't going to be a fair fight. Won't it be a fair fight? It's not a fair one with us either because we have the power of God. So, encourage our hearts to be faithful. I love that title that Jesus won. The author and perfecter of our faith. What a title he must honor that one with. Wow. What an honor title. And that's my Savior. I'm so thankful for it. Encourage our hearts tonight. In Jesus' name, amen.